this right here ain't on. There we go. We got it now. All right. So one hand is Luke 23. You have the account of the thief on the cross. The other hand is Paul the Apostle. And I want to show you this. Um, the question is this. Where are the Old Testament saints? And Because it, there, there's an apparent contradiction. I want to show the apparent contra contradiction about the, the saints and all that. It's not a contradiction once you put all the pieces of the puzzle together. If you just draw two verses, it seems like there's a contradiction. So two things we, we need to talk about in the next few weeks. Today I'm going to address one in two-part message because there's, I think, 40-something verses, and I don't think I'm going to get to all of them in one Sunday school class. It'll, you guys will be turning so fast, it'll be about two verses every minute or something like that. Or, you know, so I don't, I don't want to rush through it. But two parts. Number one, we'll go there. Matthew 12, 38 and 40 says, As the Son of Man was, or as Jonah was three days, three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. We'll go there in just a minute. There's two parts of that that I got to answer. I got a question that was in here concerning um, Good Friday, which Good Friday is a farce. It's, it's an invention of the Catholic Church. There is no such thing as the Good Friday, right? There's no way it's impossible for Jesus to have been crucified on Friday. And so we'll look at that. We'll look at that. There's a reason why they say that. We, we may have time to look at that. But we really want to look at the biblical account. It was more, it, it really either had to be a, you can get a Wednesday or a Thursday, depending on how you count the days. And I want to show you, I, I personally believe, based on the way the feasts are lined up, you have a high day, and then you have, right after it, a Sabbath. Uh, the first day of that um, Passover was considered a day of, you couldn't work on that day. So it would explain why they wanted the bodies down off the cross before the Passover, right? Because you had two days in a row that you couldn't work, right? Because you had the first day of Passover and then you had the Sabbath, okay? So you have to, to me, Thursday day is the one that makes the most sense. I'll go over that. I had that specific question put to me, but in combination with that question was a question I had from Karen last week concerning these saints and where they go and it puts it'll help her put a, a piece of the puzzle together prior to the cross listen the sin debt we know couldn't be paid by the blood of bulls and goats the Bible says that and we'll go and put those pieces together so what happened with the Old Testament saints is the question let me show you the contradiction that it's an apparent contradiction um, notice what it says here, verse 39. We know this is, they call him the thief on the cross, but we could call him the murderer on the cross because he was also a murderer, wasn't he? We can call him the insurrectionist on the cross because he was an insurrectionist too. One of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. <clears throat> and the other answered, uh, answering, rebuked him, saying, Dost thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we have received the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me <clears throat> when thou comest in thy kingdom. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And so Jesus said, Today. Thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, let me tell you something Jehovah's Witness to do with this verse because a lot of people have confronted them about this passage. If he said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise, paradise is not something we're waiting on in the future, right? It already exists. So let me tell you what Jehovah's Witness do. It's kind of tricky, but it also contradicts every other verse in the, in, in the book of Luke especially and the other Gospels. They take the comma and move it from before today to after today, where Jesus is saying this to them today. You see that? You say, what's, why, why would that not be an issue? Because the Hebrew didn't have commas. Because context. You know, you can look up that phrase, I say unto thee. Why, why would he have to say, I'm saying it today? He's saying it right now. It don't even make sense. Why would he have to say, today? You know, I say unto thee, today. I'm saying it today. Who cares? We know he's saying it today. That's redundant. You see what I'm saying? But here's the big problem. 
Go look this phrase up if you want to do a good study. I say unto thee. There's not another reference where he says, I say unto thee in the book of Luke, or the other ones, and then he says today. So you know what that tells me? This reference is different than the other. It's different. So he's saying physically, when I die today, you're going to be with me in paradise. But if you look up the... Why wouldn't he say, I say unto thee on another... Now give, me, give me the passages, Mom, I gave you on your phone. Let me illustrate what I'm saying to you. Notice what he says, Verily I say unto thee today. Does Jesus ever make that statement, I say unto thee? Yeah, or I say unto you, period. Yes, he does. And watch, he doesn't use the word today after any of them. So this is a different reference. He's not saying it today. He's saying, look, this day you're going to be with me wherever I'm at. That's what he's telling him. Give me one. Go to Luke 12. Let me just illustrate this. You can look all of these up. I just want to show you this so that, that you don't take my word for it. You take the word of God for it. Verily means of a truth or truly, right? So watch, watch him say this again. Luke 12, 44. He says, of truth I say unto you. Why doesn't he say today there? You see what I'm saying? He don't have to say today because he's saying it today. Of a truth I... So he is saying, look, you're going to be with me today. He's not saying I'm saying this to you today. Can everybody see that? Is that plain enough? I just want to make sure that I'm, I'm making this clear enough. Give me another reference, Mama. Luke 13, 24. And you guys can go to all of these and you can see that he's, he's saying this today. He, verse 24. Strive to enter into the straight gate. For many I say unto you. Why didn't he say many I say unto you today? I mean, he's already saying it. You don't have to say I'm saying it today. You see what I'm saying? So the other reference of today, he's emphasizing that this thief on the cross is going to be with me today. He said, preacher, why are you even bringing this up? Because this is what's going to happen. You're going to run into a Jehovah Witness and their Bible is going to have the comma after today and you need to be able to go back and show them every other reference in Luke does not have today after it, today comma. He don't have to say today. You know he's saying it today. He's not, he's not saying I'm saying to you, thief, sometime in the future, but I'm saying this today, that you're going to be with me in paradise. He's saying, this day when I die, and you're going to die, me and you are going to be together somewhere. That's what he's saying. And so, let me show you, the, the Job Witness tried to get around the contradiction by moving the comma, and they cause a contradiction by moving it, right? Because it doesn't agree with the other passages in the Scriptures. Here's the contradiction. Go to... Um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. 2 Corinthians 12. So, the, the, two, uh, the few references you're going to have on paradise we're seeing. But I, wanna, I want you to see why it's such a problem. Because where was Jesus that day? Three days and three nights. Right? He wasn't in heaven, was He? You know He wasn't in heaven, so where were He and the thief that day? That's a good question, isn't it? They weren't in heaven, because he, he, tells, he tells His disciples, and we're going to go there, touch me not, I'm not yet ascended. He says that in the book of John. He said, I had not gone to my Father yet, don't touch me. Until I ascend and I'm going to come back. And then He lets Thomas touch Him. So where was He? If He ascended after the third day, he wasn't ascended prior to that. Everybody with me on that? I'm just trying to explain that to you so you can understand. Look at this. It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Now think about this. The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth His handiwork. So they're, according to the Scriptures, He's saying the third heaven. So, the Scriptures identifies where the birds fly as one heaven. It's called, it speaks about the birds flying there 
And then plural, it speaks the heavens where the birds fly and where the sun, moon, and star are at. The Bible also refers to that as heaven. But then there's the heaven of heavens that the Bible talks about, which is where the throne of God is. So according to Paul, the third heaven is where the throne of God is. And so watch what he says here. I was caught up. Was he caught up or was he caught down? Up. Now, I want you to see this. The Son of Man shall be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Where's that? Up or down? Where's the heart of the earth? Where's your heart? It's in the dead center of you. Where's the heart of the earth? It's dead center of the earth. We'll get there in just a minute. I want you to see this. Caught up the third heaven. I knew such a man... Whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell God knoweth. How he was caught up into where? Caught up into paradise. So Jesus says, you're going to be with me in the heart of the earth today. But Paul says, I was caught up to paradise. He calls that paradise. You're going to be with me in paradise. And then Paul says, I was caught up to paradise. How do we reconcile that in the Scriptures? It's not very hard. Uh, I'm going to ask one of my, my boys if you can get this whiteboard out for me just for a minute. Just get it and set it up here for a minute and make sure there's, yeah, there's a pen there. So I'll, I'll show you this. If I draw it, it might help you. I, I don't draw good, but I can draw boxes and compartments. But this is what I want you to see. Go to Matthew chapter 12 and let's begin laying the foundation. I wanted to show you the problem first and then answer the problem. Somebody didn't turn that air down, did they? I'm, I'm a little bit chilly, actually. Yeah, that's good right there. Let's set it, up, set it right there. Look at Matthew chapter number 12, verse 38. You might do the other one too, son. Yeah, that's good like that. That's good. I want you to see what it says here. It says in verse number 38, certain of the scribes and Pharisees answered him, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh the sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it but the sign of Jonas. Watch this. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Where's the heart of the earth? It's in the center. Now what I'm going to do is lay the foundation. Go to Luke chapter number 16. I'm going to show you this up front, and then I'm going I'm to put the pieces of the Bible together for you so that you can physically see this. Luke. Chapter number 16. Y'all remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? Watch, watch this story. Uh, verse number 19. And there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Not a parable. Why? Jehovah Witness will tell you this is a parable. Do you know that names are not mentioned in parables? There is a name mentioned here. I kindly point, because people don't, the old witness don't believe in hell, and they try to say this is not real. It is real. This is a person who really went to hell, and four times it mentions torments. If hell is the grave, what is this guy doing being tormented? You understand what I'm saying? What torment is there in the grave if that's the end of everybody? Notice verse 20, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, and was carried by the angels unto heaven? No. Abraham's bosom. Now, now watch, I want to show you something here. And the rich man died and was buried, and in hell... Do we know where hell's at scripturally? We do know where hell's at scripturally. I'm going to spend the greater the part of this Sunday school hour showing you where hell's at so I can build the foundation for the evening service. These two are going to work hand in hand. I'm going to show you 
where these saints go, but I have to lay the foundation. We have to, where is hell? If Jesus was in the heart of the earth, where was he at? Listen, it said he was preaching to spirits that are in prison. Where is that at? Again, again, I want you to see this. Look at it and, and pay attention to what he's saying here. And it, uh, verse 22, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels unto Abraham's bosom. And the rich man died also and was buried. In hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off. He could see him. You see that? Could he see him or couldn't he? Now watch. Seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his uh, finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. And Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Now is he comforted, and thou art tormented. Now watch. Watch the picture. Watch the picture. Besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed so that they cannot pass from hence uh, to you, uh, they that can pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from hence. Let's draw it out. It helps sometimes for me to draw it out. I'm not an artist, so don't laugh. If you laugh, I'm going to make you draw it. So, rich man dies. He's in hell, right? We know that hell, and we're going to establish that hell's in the heart of the earth, so it's below our feet. Hottest thing known to man is below your feet. It says hell doth enlarge herself. You ever think about that? It gets hotter, hotter, expands. You know what happens when it expands? It shoots out the top. But notice this. You got the rich man. Here he is. He's in this place of hell. And there's a great gulf fixed. I don't know what is causing them to not pass. But this rich man can see from wherever he's at, he can see Lazarus and Abraham. This is called Abraham's bosom. Okay. Whatever's in this gulf prevents them from passing from one place to the other. This is all going on in the heart of the earth. The rich man's looking. He can see Lazarus over there in Abraham's bosom. He's, he's tormented. Lazarus is comforted. And he's saying, look, I want you to send Lazarus across here so I can just get a he could dip his finger in water and give me to drink. Right? And so Abraham begins to say, we can't. Even if we wanted to, we couldn't. Because there's a great gulf. But do you, do you see they're actually talking? Where, well, however this gulf is set up, they're talking back and forth across the gulf. Can you see that? And I want you, this is very important for me to put the pieces together because the Bible said... That Jesus, this, this, this place right here is a holding place for the damned. Revelation 20, when we get there this afternoon, we might get there this morning. He says, look, I saw the dead, small and great stand before God. Books were opened, another book was opened, uh, which is the book of life. And they were judged every man out of those books according to their works. And death and hell were delivered which direction? Up. They're delivered up they have to come up out of something and so this hell is a holding place a judgment place for people that are in is a prison waiting for final judgment waiting for that everlasting death which is the death penalty the second death this is a holding place listen hell is not the end you die right now without jesus christ you're going to hell but one day you're going to stand before the throne of God and you're going to have to give an account 
And the last verse of Revelation 20, verse 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into a lake of fire. There's a lake of fire is your ultimate end. This hell, uh, the old saying was, you just go from the frying pan to the fire. Okay? So, I wanted you to get this picture because if we can figure out where hell is at, which we can scripture-wise, we can figure out where hell's at, can't we? Let's run through some verses real real quick to show where hell's at. Said the Lord was in the heart of the earth. Let's look here. Let's go to Deuteronomy uh, chapter number 32. I'm going to move a little bit fast, but I'll try it. If I need to slow down, put the brakes on me, okay? Deuteronomy 32. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Chapter 32, verse 22. For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn into the lowest hell. Do you see that? And shall consume the earth with her increase. So wherever this hell is at, that's the lowest, it has to be on the earth if it's going to consume the earth with her increase. Do you see that? Set on fire the foundations of the mountains. And so Job chapter number 11. Job. Job 11. We're just going to put as many of these pieces of the puzzle we can together while we have time. Job chapter number 11. Verse number 8, it is as high as heaven, what canst thou do deeper than what? So however you classify it, it's deep, deeper than hell. And once we put the other pieces together and you see that hell is beneath your feet, you'll know that he's saying this is in the heart of the earth, it's what he's saying right here. How do you know? The other passages, we'll get there, uh, Psalm 55, Psalm 55. Psalm 55. Do y'all see how a doctrinal message goes? You lay each foundation as you build up to your point. And so we have to lay the foundation that hell is in the heart of the earth before we can actually establish where Jesus Christ was at and what he was doing. Okay? Does the Bible say that Jesus was burning in hell? The Bible never says that anywhere. And there's people who believe that. He burned for our sin. No, Christ died for our sin. He shed His blood for our sin. That, he, he didn't burn in hell for our sins. But we do know what He was doing because the Bible shows us that He's preaching to somebody. Yes, ma'am. Like unto the Son of God. That's right. That's right. Very good. Dixie, that's right. Look at Proverbs 55, verse 15. I mean Psalm, sorry. Psalm 55, verse 15. Let death seize upon me and let them go down quickly into hell for the wickedness is their dwelling in their dwellings and among them. You see that? Go to chapter 86. Chapter down, go down. And I want you to see this because he's, he's going to clarify this here in just a minute. Just bear with me. Verse 13, Psalms 86, verse 13. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So wherever it's at, it's low. Compared to what? We're going to find out it's talking about the heart of the earth. Proverbs 15, Proverbs. The next book over, Proverbs 15. Proverbs 15, verse 24. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell where? Beneath. Beneath. Perspective of a man. What is beneath us? 
it's down in the ground below us. And I want you to see this. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. Verse number 9, speaking of Lucifer. 9 says, Hell from beneath is moving for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up their thrones and all the kings of the nation. We could keep reading here, but look at verse number, notice it's beneath. Verse number 15 again, speaking of Lucifer. And thou shalt be brought down to hell, the sides of the pit. So there's a pit in hell. And it has sides. Ezekiel chapter 31. Ezekiel 31. Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. Just a few books to the right. I'm trying to keep it somewhat in order. Ezekiel 31. Ezekiel 31, verse 16. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall when I cast him down to hell with them that descend into the pit and all the trees of Eden and the choice and best of Lebanon shall drink water and shall be comforted and the nether parts of the earth. Notice verse 17. They also went down into hell with him. So notice down into hell twice. And Amos is going to put the nail in the coffin for us. Amos chapter 9. A few books to the right. Amos 9. Verse number 2. Amos 9 verse 2. Where you at, Mike? You getting it? I just want you to see this. Verse 2. Though they dig into where? So, <laughs> it's a place you can dig into. Which direction is digging? It's down. You're digging down. Dig into hell. Thence shall mine hand make them, so on and so forth. But you see the direction. Talking about climb into heaven. Digging into hell. So hell, obviously, is before you, b- below your feet. Hell beneath, it, it direction is down. Re- that's why in Revelation 20, the verse you heard me quote, go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation 20. That's why it, the direction in Revelation 20 is hell is coming up. Okay, because it's beneath our feet now. Revelation 20, verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. So the direction being delivered up for judgment is from beneath. Do you see that? Being delivered up. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Go back to the left. Matthew 11. This is better than a sword drill, isn't it? We used to do them sword drills. Somebody would say the verse and you had to find it. Matthew 11, verse 23. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted into heaven, shall be brought down to where? Hell, for the mighty works which have been done in thee, and done in uh, Sodom, uh, had been done in Sodom, it would have remained unto this day. Notice, down. 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm just showing you there's a multitude of authors that give the direction, perspective of man, down. It's down. Matthew, or uh, 2 Peter 2. 
2 Peter chapter 2. All right. Let's look down around verse number 4. 2 Peter 2, 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, I believe this is Genesis 6 personally. If you don't want to believe that, that's fine, but I believe that's who he's talking about. But cast them down to where? Hell, and deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. He cast them down to hell. Uh, no, no doubt the heart of the earth. And so we begin laying the foundation. With, is, is anybody here unclear of the direction of hell? Based on the verses that we've got. Are there any questions on that? It's pretty evident if you can dig down and it's beneath everything. Oh, you put all the pieces of the puzzle together. Where is hell? It's below your feet. It's in the heart of this earth. Ironically, that's the hottest thing known to man. It's right below our feet. That lava comes shooting up. It ought to be, you would think mankind would, would take the hint. You know? You don't want to go there. With all these pieces together, if the Bible says that hell's in the heart of the earth, it says the rich man went there, right? He went there. It gives a description of the location where he's at, that there's a gulf, he could see a cross. And then Matthew chapter 12, verse number 39 and 40 says, as the Son of Man... As Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of the Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He's right here. He's, he's down there somewhere. And so some people say he went to hell and burned for our sins. Others said he was in Abraham's bosom. This is what we're going to start doing, putting the pieces of the puzzle together. We know he was somewhere. Now here's the problem. If you say he's in hell um, and burning for our sins, this whole location down here is referred to as hell in the Bible. And it's also, there's sections of it. Abraham's bosom is one of them. And in the place of torment. We find that Jesus is doing something when he goes here. Right? He's not down here burning. You don't find any account of Jesus burning in the flame, do you? Not a single one. You can't find one. But you can find an account that he did something when he was down there. It speaks about him preaching. We're, we're, we're going to see this just for a minute. We might not be able to get through all of this. But go to Psalms chapter number 16. This is actually the second half. We made better ground than I thought we was going to. Psalm. 16. Psalm 16. Preacher, why are you laboring through this and you go through all these verses? Because you know what? You want to know what the truth is about the God's Word and you have to put the pieces of the puzzle together. Some people are going to try to convince you about something that's not biblical and you need to know how to defend yourself and, and, and stand on behalf of the truth. Look at... um. Psalm 16, verse number 10. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. How do you know? Because it's mentioned in Acts as well. We'll go there. Notice it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul where? In hell. Neither wilt thou suffer thy Holy One to seek corruption. You know how I know that Jesus is not burning in hell? Neither will thou see thy Holy One suffer corruption. Is that what it said? Listen, this right here would be corruption if he's burning in hell. See, here's the thing. He had sin placed on him, but he had no sin in him. You know who goes to this place right here? People who have sin in them. When they don't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to them, they go to that place called hell. Watch this. Go to Acts chapter number 2. Acts 2. This prophecy, if you didn't know it was about Jesus Christ in the Old Testament, 
When you get to Acts chapter number 2, it's very clear. Acts 2. Acts 2. Verse number 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved to God among us by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, do you see that? And loosened the pains of death, because it's not possible that he should be holden of them. Isn't that something? David speaketh concerning him, I saw... I, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for He is on my right hand, and I shall not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh had rest in hope, because Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt Thou suffer Thy Holy One to seek corruption. This is about Jesus. Thou hast made known unto me the ways of life, and Thou shalt make me full of joy with Thy countenance. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and in the scepter is with us uh, unto this day. So it's not speaking of David. David's got a prophecy, but it can't be speaking of David. They had his bones. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, would raise up Christ to sit on his throne... He, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Uh, this Jesus had God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. And we could, we could just read on, but notice this. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, that he shed forth, that he shed forth this which... It, ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended unto the heavens. Do you see that? But he saith himself, The Lord saith unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I, I make thy enemies thy footstool. Listen. The Bible says that Jesus made an open display of those principalities and powers. He put them to an open shame, the Bible said, at the cross, Colossians chapter number 1. Right? And then you see the, the Bible speaks concerning Jesus Christ that his soul was not left in hell. Watch this. What did he say? What's, what did he say before he gave up the ghost on the cross? It is finished. The work that he had to do to pay the sin debt was finished on the cross. Listen, it wasn't finished... Listen, it wasn't finished in hell. He's not burning in hell for you. He already had the blood to offer for the sacrifice of our sins. And we're going to, the next hour, what I want to do the, the next hour, we're going to have to stop right here because I'm going to get too far into this and I need to take my time and go through this. But the next hour, uh, this afternoon, what we're going to run through is I'm going to show you what Jesus was doing during that time period. Um, and we're also going to see that he had a work. He had to descend for a reason, and he carries somebody with him when he ascends into heaven. So he descends for a purpose, and then when he ascends, he's taking people with him, and we actually have record of those going with him. We have record of people being resurrected, the Old Testament saints. We see them walking about on the earth, uh, and uh, no doubt that part of that ascension into heaven. Uh, we're going to go through verses like he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men. So he had a purpose. He descended first, the Bible says, and we're going to go through this. He descended. Does it say that? What's the descent? Is that down or up? So he went down into something. Peter's going to put the, some of the pieces of the puzzle, what he was doing when he went there. And then he went back up and took people with him when he went back up. 
That's why you see the relocation of paradise now absent from the body present with the Lord, but you see Lazarus in the Old Testament, it wasn't absent from the body present with the Lord. It was absent from the body present in Abraham's bosom or present in hell. It wasn't till the cross that the sin debt was paid. Everybody prior to the cross, listen, did the blood of bulls pay the sin debt? It didn't. The Bible tells you that over and over. The book of Galatians tells you that. The book of Hebrews tells you that. They're looking forward, trusting what God... It doesn't mean they weren't forgiven. God still has the power to forgive, doesn't He? But that sin debt was fully paid at the cross. That's prior to the cross, and after the cross, the sin debt was paid. The sin debt, listen, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. But let me say this. The blood of bulls and goats, Hebrews 9 and 10, tells you could never take away sin. So if it couldn't take away sin in the Old Testament, there had to be something come to take away the sin. And we see this. What did John the Baptist say of Jesus Christ when he saw him? This taketh away the sin of what? The New Testament people after the cross? Sin of what? Everybody. The sin of the world. Jesus took away the sin of the world. He paid the sin debt of the Old Testament saints who were looking forward, who the Bible tells you didn't receive the promises at the time. They were still waiting on them. We're, we're going to go through those verses. I'm going to take you. Don't take, I'm trying to give you an overview, but then I'm going to literally take you to the verses so you can see them for yourself. So what I encourage you, if you can't be here this afternoon, I encourage you to be here, but if you can't, Please listen to the second half so I can put the pieces of this puzzle together. But I had to establish first that hell is beneath our feet. And I think I did a pretty decent job of doing that. Does anybody have any questions on that so far? Does it make sense where it's at? So the next hour what we'll do is begin to show what was going on down there, what Jesus was doing, and then we'll, we'll show that he had a work to do after um, he ascended. We're going to see he went and spread blood on that mercy seat in heaven. Right? He went through the Spirit and b- spread the mercy seat, the blood. The mercy seat down here was only a picture of what really was in heaven. But when he spread that blood on there, he made an atonement, Old Testament and New Testament saints, and paid all the sin debt, period. Okay? The difference is we can look back at the cross. And say that's what happened. They were looking forward and saying God's going to send somebody. God is sending somebody. Every time they sacrificed that lamb. You know what they were showing? God's promise is that the shedding of blood would pay our sin debt. And they're showing that every time they shed that blood. And here, here, think about what they're doing. They're going in. There's a mercy seat in heaven. But Moses was told to build one on the earth that's like it. And Moses is going on there sprinkling that blood on there or Aaron Aaron his son sprinkling that blood on there but that physical mercy seat is only a picture of the real mercy seat in heaven that's why people ask me about the ark all the time they get all worked up about a piece of wood that's on the earth you know what I tell them that stuff don't even bother me the ark of God the true ark of God is in heaven it's always been in heaven what we had on earth is just a picture of what was in heaven. And it's just, a, to me, it's, it's, it's not the real thing. The real thing is in heaven. Okay? No, it says he will we'll go there this afternoon. It's in uh, the book of Second Peter chapter 3, I believe. But it, it does identify the crowd that he's preaching to. The crowd that... Um, the sin in, in Noah's day. That's the crowd he's specifically targeting. And if you put all the pieces together, what we have so far, they're here. And he's preaching to them that they should have believed what God said. Okay, so he, But he also has a work because it says he led captivity. Th- this part is going to st- stay for judgment. But this part right here is waiting. Why are they captive? They're captive because they're waiting on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. 
So they're being held here. It's not captive in the sense of somebody being forced, although they didn't have a choice, right? But it's captive in the sense that they're, we say a captive audience, right? They're captivated. Right, they're just being held. This is a notice. It, it, uh, uh, people say, "Well, well, held again." Well, it says that he's comforted. So where, wherever these people are at, it's a place of comfort. No, no. I mean, they're in Abraham's bosom, and it says it's a place of comfort. Lazarus was comforted, and the rich man was tormented. Right, but it says he led captivity captive. He ascended. And led captivity captive. That's this crowd right here. And captive in what sense? They're captivated by where they're going. You don't think you're going to be captivated by heaven? I'm going to be captivated by heaven. It's not going to captive is captive is mostly used in our generation negative. But captive can actually be positive. Right? You're captivated when you go see a show or a light show or see some fancy whatever. We, we go to medieval times sometimes and we're captivated by what they're doing. Right? It doesn't mean they're holding us there hostage with a gun and I don't have a choice. It means I'm enjoying what I'm seeing, what I'm doing. So captivity captive, you've got to keep it in its context. He's, he's taking them to a place they long to be, a place they've been looking for. That's a, does that answer your question, Cappy? You got any more? So we'll try to cover that this next hour okay well this afternoon we we haven't even got there brother but that is that passage in first samuel 28 is in my notes it's all pieces of the puzzle we have you see how the bible works doctrine wise you can't just take one verse and just isolate it because you're going to get messed up you got to take all of them and put them together if you're going to learn doctrine and then it paints a good picture but notice the parts. We're talking about doctrinal message in our, our study. The parts we had to establish first is where is hell at. And then we had to establish what's going on down there, which we have verses to do that. The next, this afternoon, what we're going to establish is the Old Testament saints, what happened with them that were in Abraham's bosom. What did Jesus do? That's what we're going to do after that. He, 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 there's several verses on it, several verses. Okay? All right. Let's just take a break right there. And I'm going to ask.